Tis a gift to be simple, tis a gift to be free, tis the gift to come down where you ought to be. And when we find ourselves in the place just right, t'will be in the valley of love and delight. Hello and welcome. Welcome to this online service of worship for this third Sunday in our Easter season, April 18th, 2021. My name is the Reverend Judith Evenden. As the Minister for Crossroads United Church in Kingston, Ontario, I'm delighted that you're taking time out to worship with us today. In keeping with the new and more limited restrictions placed upon us all, our worship team is now a team of four. Joining me in leadership are Shirley Porter and Kevin Guthrie, the Crossroads Music Directors, and Alan Baer, a volunteer who wears multiple hats in the production of these services. We may be few in number, but we are keenly aware that we are being held in love and prayer as we create these services of worship for us all. And today, perhaps more than on any other day, as we do this work in isolation, we are reminded that we never do it alone. So let me express our gratitude for all the ways that Crossroads United Church has been supported through the donations that have come from our members and adherents, and from those of you who have watched us online and sent in checks, e-transfers, perhaps even signed up for our monthly PAR program, or have used the Canada Helps donation tab on our website. Such gifts are deeply appreciated as they have enabled us to maintain our full staff complement and continue to reach out to our congregation and to our community during this past year. And so we pray. Creator God, receive these gifts of money, time, and talent that represent the fruits of our love for you, for our community, and for ourselves. Help us to use these gifts as you use us to spread your message of love throughout the world. Amen. On Friday of this past week, Karen Elliott, 
our church administrator emailed and mailed, uh, and we also posted on our website and on our Facebook page our April newsletter. In it are a number of announcements that I wish to lift up to you today. We have known for quite some time, over a year now, that Karen was going to retire at the end of June after almost a decade of service to Crossroads United Church. While we can never replace her, we do need to fulfill the position. A notice to that effect is in our newsletter, and I invite you to share that news with anyone you think might wish to apply. We also needed something to look forward to, and so there is an announcement for a possible plant and yard sale in our parking lot on May 29th. There's also a poem penned by one of our members, part two of what I learned about life from jigsaw puzzles, a financial update, and a poster for our spring wellness programs. The first three pages of this newsletter is a message from me outlining a process of discernment that has led me to decide and make known my intention to retire from active ministry within the United Church of Canada, effective November 1st of this year. In the midst of a pandemic, there is no right time to make an announcement, but I believe this is the time for us to begin to express both our gratitude and grief as this time together as minister and congregation begins to draw to its close. In the six and a half months that we have left, I hope we will stay true to our covenant to be together on this journey of faith, always seeking God's guidance as we make our way. May it be so. Amen. As we begin our worship this day, we acknowledge the territory where we are located, we are on a journey of reconciliation with the First Peoples of this land, and so we acknowledge that Crossroads United is on the traditional territory of the Wendat, the Haudenosaunee, and the Anishinaabe people. Where I live and work from at home in North Frontenac, it is unceded Algonquin territory. And I invite you to name the traditional territory where you are watching this from today. Like many of you, this morning I took time to watch and worship with the royal family as they laid to rest His Royal Highness the Duke of Edinburgh, Prince Philip. And perhaps also, like many of you, not only was I thinking about and praying for that family, I was also keenly aware of the many for whom we have lost through death in this past year, a year for when we've not been able to gather together for funerals. For all of them, we light our candles, trusting that God's perpetual light shines upon them and upon us all. We are witnesses to the love God has poured into us. We are witnesses of God's love, sharing it with each person we meet. We are witnesses to everyone we encounter, little children like us, sisters and brothers in God's family. And so as we gather, let us sing together with Kevin and Shirley and Alan, a new song penned by Amanda Udis Kessler, We Have Gathered. Let's sing together.
commitment to a planet that is whole. Works of justice, acts of kindness, bless the world and heal our souls. As our voices join to Now, just as we turn to the scripture reading assigned for us this day, let us begin this prayer. Gracious and holy God, greater than our most exalted conception of you, and yet nearer and more intimate than our very breath, we thank you for this day and for the happy news of this Easter season, whose songs of joy we make our own. Help us to know you for ourselves and in those times when you seem most elusive, help us to trust the testimony of those whose knowledge of you far exceeds our own. Help us to keep growing, even in times of doubt. Help us to keep hopeful, especially when despair knocks at our door. May we have the courage to follow the risen Christ wherever he might lead us, wherever he might call to us. It is in his name that we pray. Amen. Our scripture reading today comes from the book of Acts at chapter 3 as we continue to learn about the early Christian community. The lectionary provides a much shorter version than what I am reading to us today. I'm beginning at the first chapter of first verse of this third chapter. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer at three o'clock in the afternoon. And a man lame from birth was being carried in. People would lay him daily at the gate of the temple called the beautiful gate, so that he could ask for alms from those entering the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked them for alms. Peter looked intently at him, as did John, and said, Look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver or gold, but what I have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, stand up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up. And immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. Jumping up, he stood and began to walk. And he entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. All the people saw him walking and praising God, and they recognized him as the one who used to sit and ask for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. While he clung to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them at the portico called Simon, Solomon's portico, utterly astonished. When Peter saw it, he addressed the people. You Israelites, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we made him walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our ancestors has glorified the servant Jesus, whom you handed over and rejected in the presence of Pilate, though he had decided to release him. But you rejected the Holy and Righteous One and asked to have a murderer given to you, and you killed the author of life whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. And by faith in his name, his name itself has made this man strong, whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given him this perfect health in the presence of all of you. And now, friends, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers, 
In this way, God fulfilled what God had foretold through all the prophets that this Messiah would suffer. Repent, therefore, and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, so that the times of refreshing may come from the presence of God, that God may send the Messiah appointed for you, that is, Jesus. May God's Spirit invite us to hear in these words from our scripture a word for us this day. Amen. And now we are delighted to hear from our own Crossroads Choir the hymn for Voices United number 186, Now the Green Blade Rises, as they sang it in worship on April 8th, 2018. My sermon title for today is Witness or Spectator? Question mark. Some of you watching or reading this sermon were once members of the Par Christi Singers, a Kingston choral group I directed for a couple of years in the early 1990s. This was a mixed voice choir who sang a wide variety of music from show tunes to spirituals from classical to pop. We performed all over Kingston in a variety of settings. We, we went to nursing and retirement homes, the Festival of Trees at the Olympic Yacht Club, and to City Hall for a special volunteer recognition dinner. It was a lot of fun, and I enjoyed immensely those rehearsals and concerts. At some point during this pandemic year, while going through old video cassettes, I found and listened to one of those volunteer appreciation concerts. Decked out in our concert dress, long kilts for the women, red jackets and plaid ties for the men. We sang on the platform in Memorial Hall of Kingston's City Hall. Crossroads United member Eleanor Bannister, then Eleanor Schatz, was our very able and funny MC. One of the songs that day and that season of concerts was called Witness. Originally a Negro spiritual, this particular unaccompanied arrangement was written by Jack O'Halloran. It's a lot of fun to both sing and conduct. But more than fun, this song had then, and I suspect has now, a powerful effect on both singer and listener alike. It pulls you into a story that is centuries old as it recalls two biblical characters, one Old Testament and one New, who struggle to find a path of faith that is authentic. And then the song asks, who will be a witness for my Lord? One character is Nicodemus, the religious leader who comes to Jesus under the safe cover of night to try and understand what Jesus is teaching. His transformation culminates in him being a strong witness right to the end, being one of those who takes the crucified Jesus down for the cross and lays him in the tomb. 
The other person sung about is Samson, the last of the ancient judges of Israel. His strength believed to be given to him by God it is notable and helps him defeat many. But his strength also threatens those who want power over those whom Samson protects. They are able to steal that strength, but only for a time. Ultimately, that God-given strength enables Samson to rise up and destroy those who have harmed him and others, even though he knows he will die in the process. Before and after each of these stories, the song asks, Who will be a witness for my Lord? The refrain asks it three times. And after the third, Who will be a witness for my Lord? The almost shouted response is, I will be a witness for my Lord. The question implied by this sermon title is this, are we, am I, a witness or merely a spectator? In a world where almost everyone has a cell phone that can make a video or take pictures, there are many spectators. But how many of them are witnesses? I wonder, have any of you been a witness? Have you ever been the recipient of a subpoena to be a witness? I have. It happened a long time ago, back when I was living in a one-bedroom apartment on the third floor of a small apartment complex on Markland Street in Kingston. I was still an undergraduate student in the music department at Queens, and this was my first home away from the family home in Hamilton. One, late one night, I, I heard a crash outside. I went to the window and saw a car that had smashed into a, another vehicle parked on the side of the road. The driver got out and then started to stagger down the street. I called the police, told them what I had seen and the direction the driver was headed. I don't recall what happened after that. I don't think I went down to speak to the police, but I may have. I know I thought my involvement had ended there on that night. Months later, I got a subpoena in the mail telling me that I was called, that I might be called as a witness for the prosecution in a case against a person whose name I did not even know. At first, I can't remember anything about why I'm being asked to be a witness. A witness to what, I wonder? So I call the number on the phone and speak to someone in the city prosecutor's office saying that I have no idea what I am supposed to have witnessed. And they remind me of my late night call to the police and tell me the person was charged with driving while intoxicated. Because I heard the crash and saw the driver exit the vehicle, I was a witness. For months, I was anxious as the date grew closer. My memory of that night was vague, and my only view of the driver was from a third-floor window of my apartment on a dimly lit street. I was going to be called to speak about what I had witnessed, even though my memory was vague and my knowledge, as far as I was concerned, was limited. Was I ever relieved when the prosecutor's office called to say the person had pled guilty and I would not have to testify? I didn't have to be a witness for or against anyone. Today in the story we read from Acts, we hear about a scene that takes place just outside an entrance to the temple in Jerusalem, the beautiful gate. I chose to expand the assigned lectionary reader reading offered to us today to include this encounter at the entrance because it is about this event that Peter is speaking in the verses the lectionary offers for us. As the story goes, there's a man who is lame. He has been lame since birth. Each day he is carried by whom we do not know, it could be family or friends or perhaps members of the synagogue, and left outside at the entrance gate to beg for whatever he is able to get from those who pass by on their way into the temple for prayer. Instead of dropping coins into this man's container or lap, Peter and John, as they are going into the temple for the three o'clock prayers, stop and look right at him. Peter looks him in the eyes and speaks to him saying, look at us. I have no silver or gold, but what I have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up and walk. 
Peter then reaches out his right hand and helps the man to stand up. Once up, he realizes that his ankles and feet are strong. The story says he was leaping and praising God and that he had then walked into the temple with Peter and John. Well, can you just imagine the surprise of all those people who for years have passed him as they enter the temple to pray? Can you imagine the surprise of those who faithfully carried him there and presumably home each day? They are astonished. Peter and John didn't just drop a coin and leave him in the same predicament. They reached out to lift him up out of the life he had been living. A life that was being perpetuated by those who brought him to the door each day without ever taking the time to help him stand up and go inside. Such is the dilemma that many of us face each time we walk or drive down the street and see a person holding out a sign that asks for help or see them sitting on the ground with a cup for coins before them, coins that most of us never carry anymore. Such is the dilemma for those of us who have much wrestled each time that we've witnessed someone without the means to provide for themselves food and shelter. Such is the dilemma that I'm confronted with each month as our church hands out $25, $25 grocery cards to those who line up in the early hours to receive this modest support. And there are always more than 25 who come, so there are always those who leave empty-handed. To be honest, when I arrived at Crossroads United, I was very uncomfortable with this voucher ministry. The people who arrive each month seem to come earlier and earlier, knowing that our resources are limited and the last are never first. In many ways, it's a race for the fittest amongst them or those who have access to reliable transportation. When I first came, the cards were worth only $15, and that had increased from $10 only months before. I, I found myself thinking, what, could, what good could that possibly do for someone for whom the need seems to be so great? In the pre-pandemic days and not being a morning person, I often arrived at the church only a few minutes before the cards were given out at 9 o'clock. They would open the doors around 8.30, Already there would be a long line, sometimes the full 25. Nevertheless, they were invited in, offered tea and coffee, cookies and apples, whatever had been donated. They were provided with mitts, hats and scarves in the winter and sometimes fresh vegetables or fruit or canned goods at other times. There might be some quiet conversation among those who knew each other, but most waited quietly, checking their phones, reading a book. One day, as I made my way around the circle of chairs, trying to engage each person that had come with some words of welcome and a question about their lives. I asked a couple of them if this really did help. I acknowledged that it seems like such a small amount of money for all of their efforts to come. What several of them told me was that every little bit helped, and more importantly, the volunteers at Crossroads welcomed them warmly and without judgment. Those who came didn't have to prove their need. They felt safe and blessed to have this place to which they could come and get some help without any strings attached. I was humbled by that answer. And yet it still troubles me that so much of our work as church and as society is about handouts and not providing a hand up out of poverty, and all the other things that keep people down. For the last year, we have heard over and over again just how precarious are the lives of those who are already homeless, those who are underemployed or unemployed, those who struggle with disabilities and addictions, those for whom home is not a safe place to be, those who are living from paycheck to paycheck, and those who are carrying debt loads that they cannot manage. We are witnesses to these lives. We see it, if not on the streets, then reported on the news. And the question that haunts me is this, am I being a witness or merely a spectator to these things? Am I offering a hand up or just a hand out? This past week, 
one of our Crossroads members had another humbling experience with one of our Kingston homeless folks. Walking by a coffee shop on the way to work the week before, they had stopped to engage one of the people hanging out by the coffee shop, a person who was in the process of selling some of their possessions to get a month money to live on. Upon seeing them there the second week, our member engaged them again, and this time offered to buy them a coffee. The response? I don't need your sympathy. I need a job. For months now, we have been battling an invisible foe. The virus that grew into this pandemic has turned our lives upside down. But the impact has been far more significant for those who were already living lives of challenge. We keep hearing that the only way out is the vaccines, but I don't think that is true. It isn't the vaccines alone that are going to get us out of this horrible situation. It's going to take each and every one of us to move from being spectator to witness. It's going to take all of us working together to keep each other safe. It's going to take all of us to stop, look into each other's eyes, because that's all of us as we face and ask, what can I do to help keep you safe? It's going to take all of us asking ourselves, what's really essential in my life, in your life? What can I do without that perhaps someone else desperately needs? And what can I just do without? Our world is so tilted and out of balance. There are too many looking for someone to blame as a means of diverting what is our collective responsibility to and for each other. One more time, we have been given time, more like a time out, to consider what is essential and how we want to live. As witnesses from a faith community that holds dear two commandments given by God through Jesus, love God and love your neighbor as you love yourself, how are we being called to be church in this new and vastly different world? We can't be spectators and love the way Jesus loved. We have to become a witness. We have to speak and live that kind of love that treats each other as neighbor. Needles in arms is gonna help, but more important than vaccines will be our recommitment to humanity, to each other, and to the earth. We need to walk together when it's safe to do so, hand in hand, side by side, equals, sisters, brothers, siblings on this road of life. Who will be a witness for those who are most in need? I want to end with a story from Thomas Merton's autobiography. I'm grateful to my United Church preaching colleague, the Reverend Brian Dantz from 50 United Church near Hamilton, who pulled out a part of Merton's story for his sermon this day. The book is entitled The Seven Story Mountain, which in and of itself is a wonderful metaphor for our lives. Brian writes, the mountain even becomes an image of charity and inclusiveness towards people of other religious and spiritual traditions when we allow that there may be a variety of paths up its slopes, paths with different names, teaching and rituals, that in the end lead us all together to the one peak. But what if when we get to the top and we expect and we ask to see God, the, either is, the answer is either an angel or a hand-painted sign that says, the one you are looking for is not here, but has gone down to the valley below. And the message is, Come find me. Be with me in the valley. Walk and work with me for the good of all down there. May we together, even in the midst of this pandemic and time of lockdown and beyond, find a path for the good of us all that are down here. Maybe so. Amen. And amen.
Let us pray. Gracious God, you come to us in unexpected places, in a crowded room, in a journey on a dusty road, in conversation, in the stillness. You come in the midst of our doubt, our fear, our sorrow. You come in the power of the resurrection. No pain and suffering is unknown to you. You bring us peace, and we pray for the places where there is no peace, countries torn by war, refugees seeking homes, prisoners facing torture. You bring peace, peace to the tensions and conflicts within us, to the regrets, the failures, the broken relationships, the lost friendships. You bring peace, for you are a friend to us when we are alone, when we are lonely, unseen, you are there. You bring us peace, and we pray that we too may become peacemakers, witnesses for all in you that we say and do. This is our prayer. And we lift it up with humility and trust, praying that through Jesus' words and life, we may find life. Amen. Our closing hymn is from Voices United number 649. Walk with me and I will walk with you and build the land that God has planned where love shines through. Our worship this day has ended, but our service to God continues as we engage in the world with a tender and a caring and a daring love, remembering that life is short. We do not have much time, nor do we know how much time we have to gladden the hearts and minds of those who make this journey with us. So let's be swift to love and make haste to be kind and just in all that we say and do, knowing that the blessing of God who is within and between and beyond us all goes with us this day and always and let the people say Amen
Let's sing now with Shirley and Kevin and Alan, Alan's song, May the Christ Who Walks on Wounded Feet. Show. 